Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the American Jewish Historical Society. My name is Annie Palland. I'm the executive director. Um, and I'm so excited uh, for this evening and to welcome you here as we hear and we learn about immigration today in this country and around the world. Um, there's a reason why we wanted to host this program. One, we love Suketu Mehta. He's brilliant. Um, and Nancy Foner, she's brilliant also, and so it's nice to bring them together for a conversation. Um, but also, our archive, uh, which is located in the tower right there, it's kind of connected, we have to take another elevator to get there, so I, I promise you I'm not gonna make you all get up, leave your seats and walk into the archive, um, but I want to tell you a little bit about what it is, because our archive has 30 million documents that tell the story, the stories, of American Jews from the 1600s up to the present day, um, looking at all sorts of areas. And immigration is so important in understanding American Jewish history. If you don't understand immigration, you can't understand American Jewish history. You can't understand American Jewish history without understanding immigration. Um, so, so many of the organizations that were founded in the 19th century were founded even by uh, Jews who had been here for two or three generations, they were no longer immigrants, but they understood that it was important for them to take care of new waves of immigrants coming over. So whether they were immigrants or the children of immigrants or the grandchildren of immigrants or the great-grandchildren of immigrants or even the great-great-grandchildren of immigrants, immigration continued to be important in the American Jewish community. So I just want to show you a few of the images and the documents we have. This is Max James Kohler. He was a lawyer who fought against the Chinese restriction, um, this Chinese Exclusion Act. Um, Cecilia Rozovsky, who was a social worker, she actually worked for many different organizations and she was on uh, the ground in Cuba when the St. Louis docked in Cuba and she was hoping to be able to bring the uh, passengers on this boat to the United States and, and or at least have them be able to get off in Cuba and that did not happen. And we had the papers in our archive where she describes what it felt like to be there um, at this time knowing that the people on this boat were gonna have to go back to, to Europe. Um, and she said that journalists who had been covering it fell to the ground with tears when the boat moved away and these are two girls on the boat. Um, we have the papers of Hyas, the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, that for since the 1880s took care of immigrants coming in, whether they were coming from Europe, whether they were coming from Iran, the Soviet Union. Um, and this was an organization that was created to help Jewish immigrants, but at a certain point understood that there were no more Jewish refugees to help, that Jews were where, for the most part, where they needed to be, and they expanded their mission to help all refugees. Um, and this is the great, great grandchild of immigrants that I think is so important, Emma Lazarus, who grew up just two blocks away on 14th Street, later moved to West 10th Street. But Emma Lazarus wrote The New Colossus, and we have in our collection the volume, the kind of manuscript that she had. Um, in 1886, the statue was put on the pedestal in the harbor, but people had forgotten about this poem she had written in 1883. Um, and she was in Europe while this was happening, but she hadn't forgotten her poem. And she was actually quite ill. She knew that she, would, she was likely going to die, and she gathered all of her writing together and wrote it out in the order that she thought was important in this notebook that she had bought on Sixth Avenue. Um, and she put the new Colossus first, and this is in our collection. Um, and so what is important for us to do as a society is not just have things hidden behind in the stacks or in the archives, but make sure that the stories are coming out into the public. So there's actually a room right around the corner that we're gonna be creating uh, an exhibit about Emma Lazarus. It'll be an, uh, a recreation of her brownstone parlor. You'll be able to go sit on uh, historical reproduction furniture. And then in the center is a folio um, upon which is projected the primary sources that tell her story. So this is what we're doing so that students, so that the broader public can know this story and experience it um, here. Um, and her story is important not just to understand what was happening in the 1880s, um, but her story is important to understand what is happening now. And this is why we do the programs that we do. Immigration um, continues to be something incredibly important for this country um, and for our identity. Um, and so that's why we're so pleased to welcome here tonight Suketu Mehta and Nancy Foner to talk about uh, Suketu's new book, 
this land is your land. And I know the biographies were swirling around, so you probably saw them already, but just really briefly, uh, they're both brilliant. Um, and Nancy Foner is a professor at Hunter College and the CUNY Grad School. Um, she's written numerous books, edited volumes, as well as uh, monographs, and um, not her most recent book, but one that came out a couple ago, was One Out of Three. And the title, One Out of Three, refers to the fact that one out of three New Yorkers is an immigrant. And when we did a party for her, where I worked formally at the Tenement Museum, we invited Suke to, to do the introduction uh, for that. So now we're switching, and Nancy will do an introduction and interview Suke to, um, And please join me in welcoming Suke to Meta and Nancy Foner. That's better, right? Yeah, okay. Um, where's Annie? Thank you, Annie, for the lovely introduction. And of course, it is a great honor and privilege. Um, I'm delighted to be here to um, talk about, um, with Suke Tometo, about his um, wonderful new book here, which I'm, I see there's lots of copies that you can buy, and I'm sure he'll autograph, for, right, sign them for you. Um, this Land is Our Land, an Immigrant's Manifesto. And I just want to say a few words about the book, and then uh, we'll have a, I'll have a discussion or questions with, with, with Suketa. This is truly a book for our time uh, on a subject that is gripping this country and, as you all know, dominating our politics. It's a personal, oh, it's sorry, it's a personal book born out of Suketu's experiences as an immigrant himself, but it is more than that. It takes us on a journey through the experiences of migrants in the US, but also in other parts of the world, examining why they left their homelands, why they are so often feared in the societies where they move, and why they should be welcomed there. The book is beautifully written. It's full of sharp and acute insights, as well as moving, often really heartbreaking stories. It's a book, Suketu notes, that was written in sorrow and rage, in rage about the political and economic inequalities and the legacies of colonial domination that have forced millions of people to leave the places where they've been born and raised. And in rage and sorrow about the barriers to inclusion that they face in the countries where they move. Tellingly, the book begins with a story about his family's very first night in the US when the building super in the Queen's uh, apartment building that they moved into turned off the electricity in the studio apartment that they rented because there were too many people in one room. I'm sure Suketo will tell us more about that. Uh, but Suketo also says that the book is written in hope. It makes a case as to why migrants should be welcomed and demonstrates the many benefits that they bring to this country. And indeed, the book ends with a moving story, one of the many moving stories in the book, about the election of his Indian American brother-in-law to a state Senate seat in North Carolina. So starting out with the studio apartment where the electricity was cut off to gaining a, his brother-in-law gaining a state Senate seat in North Carolina. And the book really takes us on an amazing journey covering a huge amount of material. My hat goes off to you, Suketa, because you obviously did a huge amount of research and write so beautifully that you're just carried along. So I highly recommend the book, among other things. And I should note that the New York Times also does. There's a wonderful book review coming out in Sunday uh, about the book. So. Let's get to the heart of the matter and what's in the book. Um, and I thought we could begin the discussion about the book. And I would ask Suke to, to ask him, you know, what motivated you to write this book? And how is it related to your own experiences as an immigrant? What, what motivated me to write the book was that lady sitting over there, the wonderful Amy Finity, uh, who in the summer of 2017, asked me if I would write an article about immigration for a magazine where she is an editor, Foreign Policy. And 
as Nancy knows, as Amy knows, um, I've been writing a book about New York for about the last 10 years, a book about immigration in New York. And that really, that's what I was supposed to be doing. But Amy said, you know, why don't you just, if you have a family story or something, we're doing a special issue on immigration. And, uh, you know, just, just take a few days, uh, see if you can do something for the magazine. And I did, I started writing it. But, so I began with family stories. I came here with my family from Bombay to uh, Jackson Heights in Queens in 1977. Um, and then I started writing about the reasons that my family had to move, that so many people in this city, in this world, uh, had to move. And I, then I found myself getting angrier and angrier. Angry at the staggering global hypocrisy of the rich countries, which, having pillaged and dominated the world through colonialism, war, inequality, and climate change, are now demanding that the citizens of these nations, that whose future they've robbed, not come to their countries. Um, in 2017, uh, there was this furious backlash against global migration, which has only increased um, today's newspaper headlines. I mean, every day there's headlines about what's being done to migrants in this country and across Europe, across the world. So I wrote this article um, about the reasons, you know, why people move <laughs> why they should be welcomed. And when I put it out, um, I started getting all these death threats from white supremacists. My Twitter feed, my inbox was filled with people um, telling me to go back to my country. I said, what, Queens? Uh, <laughs> and I realized that I touched her on nerve. Anne Coulter started tweeting against me. Um, and so, you know, there, were, there was such a furious counter reaction that I thought, hmm, maybe there's a book in this. <laughs> Let me really make them mad. So I wrote a book in, well, just about a year, although there's been a lot of research I've been doing for, uh, for actually much of my life about people moving across the world. Um, and that's uh, this book right here. So I wrote it, I put aside my New York book in response to the present emergency because um, today, we, there's a quarter of a billion people on this planet who are living in a country other than the one they were born in. If all the migrants were a nation by ourselves, we'd be the fourth largest country in the world, the size of Indonesia. And there's never been more resistance to this kind of migration. Um, so I wrote it because uh, I think there's a need for the kind of argument that I'm making, and also the kind of numbers that I spent uh, an enormous time gathering, you know, the research for this book that backs up uh, what I'm saying. Okay, so I think maybe a good place to start mm -hmm. would be to look at, because the first third of the book is concerned with why, what, why people are moving, basically, why they've had to leave their homelands. So perhaps we could talk just to begin a little bit. You mentioned the coloni colonialism, um, and really we're talking now about the legacy of colonialism. So could you maybe you could talk a little bit more about how the colonial legacy has uh, been a factor in causing um, causing um, the movement, this vast migration that's going on today. Sure. Um, so the book opens with a story that my grandfather who was born in India and spent his working life in colonial Kenya when it was ruled by the British, and then retired in London. So he was sitting in a park one day in North London, minding his own business, and this elderly British gentleman comes up to him and says, why are you here? Why don't you go back to your country? And my grandfather, who was a businessman, said, because we are the creditors you came to my country, you took all my gold and my diamonds, you prevented us from building our industries, so we have come here to collect. We are here because you were there. 
and it seems to me you know uh, a really precise summation of colonialism and the reasons people move to the former colonies and then the numbers are just you know incredible um during the uh, during colonial times um the european share of the world gdp went from 20% to 60% when the british arrived in india at the beginning of the 18th century india's share of world gdp was 23% by the time the british left in 1947 it had plunged to under 4% um so you know you can see this in country after country and it didn't matter who the colonial power was they went in there and they robbed these countries uh, and then they invited um people of the former colonies to their countries after particularly in the post war period as guest workers and then they forbade them from bringing in their families they had all these restrictions they could only work for a certain amount of time then they had to go back and that's why you know you have algerians in france and moroccans in the netherlands and pakistanis in british in in england so um so the role of colonialism in uh global migration is enormous and it's not just what the colonial countries did when they were in the colonies it's how they left the lousy map making that still bedevils the world so in india for example the british having ruled over the country for 200 years realized they had to now leave they were done exploiting the country so in 1947 they decided to leave and uh they asked a lawyer named Sir Cyril Radcliffe who had never been to India and they invited him down from London to the subcontinent to draw two lines down a map separating India from what was then East and West Pakistan there's something like just a little under 2 billion people today who have to live with those two lines it took him 6 weeks he spent all of 6 weeks partitioning what's now india pakistan and bangladesh so there's all these wars constantly uh, you know the often the two countries are at uh, risk of a nuclear war and part of it is the legacy of lousy map making the british also while they were in india they ruled over the country to this policy called divide and rule so they pitted the hindus and the muslims against each other um they had separate electoral constituencies established depending on what religion you are so if you if you look at religious rioting in india it's this hasn't always been that way it was deliberately created by the british so they could maintain their hold over the whole country so when people move you know because they're impoverished uh, whether it's indians to england or uh, citizens of you know african countries going to the former colonies you have to connect the dots they they're not these people aren't leaving because they hate their homelands or their language or their countries they're moving because literally they have no choice yeah when i was reading your book if i can just one in my earlier academic life i started out as uh, someone who studied in the caribbean and i studied in, in jamaica as an anthropologist and that with that's a country that people have been leaving ever since the end of slavery um and jamaica where i was was really systematically underdeveloped by the british it was a slave plantation colony the british could never get enough cheap labor so they kept importing people in and you know it created a population problem it was economically underdeveloped and the community that i live in i always remember a quote from one of the men who said you know and and it was a very beautiful village where i was living for a year and a half and he said you know jamaica is a beautiful country but we just can't make our way here and that really sums it up i mean people don't want to leave they want to stay with their families they want to stay in a country that they're familiar with um but many people in the world feel they really have no choice um but to leave um and i think that's actually a luxury that americans have that they don't realize that we don't grow up in this country thinking you know our children are going to have to leave the united states in order to make it um that's not you know not how we we think we live in a very prosperous country maybe you'll move to california but it's still the united states but in many parts of the world that's not true and that's 
you know, when you, what you were getting at uh, clearly and, and in a very moving way in your book. I wanted just to raise another issue. I mean, in light of particularly of what's going on today, one of the things you talk about is wars and violence. And of course, here we are. I mean, we're all reading the papers, right? Um, about uh, the many thousands, thousands of asylees from the Northern Triangle, right? Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador, who are now seeking entry to the US. And maybe that's a way to get at some of the things that you were talking about in the book in terms of the role of wars and violence in, in leading to migration. Sure, so another huge driver of migration is um, conflict. And a lot of the conflict has been imposed on these countries by the rich countries or the former colonizers. Now, we in the United States generally don't think of ourselves as a colonial power. I mean, we were a colony ourselves. But if we look at our record in Central America, for example, you know, it manifests all the characteristics of what the British did in India or the French did in Algeria. Um, or another way that we've uh, made you know, wreaked havoc in the world is something like the Iraq war. We went in there, there was an illegal and unnecessary war, and which led to 600,000 dead Iraqis. Um, take a look at Central America. I mean, every time there's been the possibility of um, a liberal democratic leader in El Salvador, Honduras, and all over Latin America, the American record in these places has been one of um, uh, toppling these democratically elected leaders and replacing them with someone who's more amenable to the in not to American interests but to the interests of things like the United Fruit Company. So in my book, I um, trace the history of um, you know uh, American involvement on on behalf of these uh, corporations. Um, it and it in. It goes from the Truman administration to the Eisenhower administration to the Clinton administration. <coughs> in country after country, we've gone in um, and fought against, for example, unions, um, you know, labor activists, human rights activists. And what we do now is we sell them guns and we buy their drugs. During the 1980s, we put 1.8 million guns uh, in Honduras alone to arm the Contras. Then we emptied our prisons and exported um, some of you know, our most violent criminals. Um, we deported them to countries like uh, El Salvador and Honduras, where they formed these gangs called MS-13, which are now coming back to haunt us. And then we buy the one product they have left to sell, which is their drugs. So conditions in the Northern Triangle, the homicide rates are higher than in the Middle East. There really is a civil war that's going on in these countries. And I met these people firsthand. I went to uh, um, these migrant shelters in Tijuana, in Mexico, you know, which is just below San Diego. And I remember meeting a 23-year-old Honduran mother who had this just cherubic little boy, this 18-month-old boy was playing on her lap. And in her family, um, her husband had witnessed a gang murder. He wasn't in the gangs himself, but he'd seen someone get shot. And so he had to flee for his life. And then a gang came uh, to her uh, and said, you know, we're going to, your little boy, he's going to pay for your husband's leaving. And so she immediately took the next bus north. So she, she was waiting to claim asylum. She was, wasn't going to come into the country illegally. She was going to claim her right to uh, have asylum. And the technical definition of um, the right to asylum is a well-founded fear of persecution, which she clearly had, and she had the evidence for that. But this was at the height of the family separation policy. So I'm listening to her her little boys playing with my phone, and I really love this little family. And I, and I said, you know, if you go north, they're going to snatch your baby away from you. And they might put him in a jail that's thousands of miles away, which is exactly what this country did. 
and she was weeping and she was, it, you know what a mother's love is? This boy here is dearer to me than my own life, but I would rather that someone take him away and that I never see him again, but I know that he's safe somewhere. Then I have to put him in a box six feet below the ground where I'm coming from. That was the choice she was faced with. And I guess to lead, you know, to go on, I mean, that's obviously um, the other issue, which I mean, we've been reading about in terms of the Northern Triangle, but elsewhere, is the issue of climate change. Um, which is interesting because, I mean, it's not interesting. <laughs> it's interesting in the book because you predict that it's gonna be the number one driver of migration in the 21st century. And I guess it's interesting that the academic literature has not caught up here yeah. yet <laughs> because there's actually very little, in, there's a lot written in the academic literature in the social sciences about the quote, causes of migration. But climate change doesn't get very much space at all. I think it's going to get a lot more space and you're, you know, as you, you argue, so maybe we could talk, because I think that's also affecting, I, I don't know if many of you read Nick Kristof's column in the Times, it was in the Review. I mean, he, t he focuses on a family that can't grow their crops because they're not getting enough rain in there. I mean, that, 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 that's also affecting Central America. So maybe you could talk a little bit about that. So, so mass migration is going to be de-defining human phenomenon of the 21st century. And the number one driver of this migration in the years to come is going to be climate change. And the figures are kind of indisputable. Um, um, by 2050, anywhere from 200 million to 1 billion people, according to the International Organization for Migration, up to 1 billion people will be displaced by climate change. By 2050, land that is home to 650 million people today will be underwater. And 30% of the Earth's land mass, which is home to 1.5 billion people, will be desert. You think 4 million Syrians trying to get into Germany are a problem right now? What happens when Bangladesh gets flooded and 400 million people have to find dry land? Um, at one point, the um, Prime Minister of the Maldives, which is a low-lying uh, Indian Ocean nation, he actually held an entire cabinet meeting underwater to demonstrate what his whole country is going to be like by the middle of the century. So who's responsible for this? We Americans constitute 4% of the global population but we put one third of the excess carbon in the atmosphere, and the EU another quarter. The average American uses as much energy as 35 Indians or 185 Ethiopians. So when these people move, you know, um, everything is affected by this kind of climate change. They can't grow their crops, they can't eat where they are, and there are wars which are which created by the stress on resources. Uh, so there was a study done, which I quote in my book, where um, there, these scholars studied linkages between temperature increases and wars in Africa. In hot years, things get hotter. So uh, the study predicted a 54% increase in African wars by 2030, leading to an additional 393,000 war deaths in small and big conflicts across Africa, directly attributable to climate change. It's very depressing, right? And then we don't even talk about the political situation here, reverse it. I mean, where climate change is not even recognized, right, by some of our leaders. No, it's a Chinese-made hoax. <laughs> and if it's um, Chinese-made, maybe we can impose tariffs on it. So one more question, just before we leave on, the, on why people are leaving their homelands and how they can leave. Another factor in migration, if we're talking about the US, actually in any country, is, is, is US immigration policy. Um, whether people can legally come here um, or they're excluded and in what numbers. Um, and here we get into something you do mention in your book, and that's a, a big a, a topic in uh, immigration policy in the US is whether our current system should be changed. And Trump and the Republicans have been trying to push a point system. 
uh, that would uh, allocate visas according to education, basically. It would emphasize education. Currently, the U.S. immigration system puts a primary emphasis on family reunification. About two-thirds of the immigrants who come every year come as family members of, of existing immigrants. So what's your take? I mean, this, and this is going to be a battle again. I mean, it's going to come up again and again. At the moment, we're not having this. It, there's so many other things going on, and immigration reform, quote, is you know, off the, it, not going to happen right now. But we, whenever it does, we're going to be hearing again about the point system and the push among Republicans in particular to institute a point system. So, so if you <laughs> immigration were to be restricted to skilled immigrants, I wouldn't be sitting here right now talking to you. My parents who are coming, uh, who are in the audience, um, came here because of family reunification in the 1970s. My um, aunt in Detroit sponsored uh, my mother and she came over with uh, her husband and three small children. You know. We're supposed to be a nation of family values. Um, if anyone wants to see a demonstration of this, they should go to a place called Friendship Park on the San Diego-Tijuana border. So Friendship Park is, there's actually a wall on the border or, or a large fence, um, and there's a section of it uh, which ends in the Pacific Ocean, so it's right by the beach. And there's a small section uh, which began during the Nixon administration where if you can't see your family uh, on the other side of the southern border, this is the only place along the entire border where you can go there on weekends and for 10 minutes at a time under the watchful gaze of the border patrol, you can through a thick chain link fence say hello to your family on the other side. So I spent two weeks there in Friendship Park. And that's where the Border Patrol doesn't ask for your papers. Um, so many of the undocumented or people who have work authorizations that don't allow them to leave the country go up to this fence. And I saw a man who hadn't seen his mother for 17 years. And she comes over on the other side and he puts his face up to the fence. There's no hole in it, he can't like hug her. And she comes up and her eyes are just full of tears. She hasn't seen her son for 17 years. He's here so he can send money back. And uh, there used to be a door where you could hug your family members. That got shut down by the current uh, border patrol chief of the sector. So you know what they do? They, the holes in the fence are only large enough to put your pinky through. So mom puts her pinky through on the other side. You put your pinky and you do what they call a pinky kiss. And then you tell her how much you miss her. You can, you can smell her breath. Her face is there, but you can't touch. And you can only talk for 10 minutes and then you go back. It's the most emotional place I've ever been to. It's your family after family, husbands and wives, uh, you know, children, uh, siblings, best friends, separated by this border, um, come there and just tell them how much they miss each other, how much they love each other. This is the kind of families we should be fostering. And it's a myth, if you look at the economic data, both skilled and unskilled immigration are essential to the economic prosperity of this country. Um, it, uh, the undocumented, who are very often unskilled, not, not all of them are unskilled, but you know, uh, uh, I, I dare say the majority of them are. Um, last year, they paid in $13 billion into the Social Security Fund and only got back $1 billion in benefits because they're not eligible for most benefits. Um, there are all these economic studies that show that uh, unskilled immigration is essential to native-born American women participating in the workforce because they perform these jobs of cleaning ladies and domestic helpers and nannies that allow women here to go out to their jobs in companies and you know, medicine and whatever else. You know, you look at a New York City restaurant where the, uh, the busboy 
might be Salvadoran or Guatemalan, the chef might be French, the fervor might be uh, in Eastern European or British, uh, the cabbie bringing customers to the restaurant might be Pakistani. There, there's like a, a hierarchy, but everyone works together, skilled and unskilled, to bring food to hungry people. Um, and this works as long as the Salvadoran busboy has some hope that his daughter, too, might one day grow up and be able to own a restaurant like this. Um, so this mix that we need, I mean, there's absolutely no economic doubt, no serious economist really says that um, immigration is bad for the country. So it's, it's the question of how you mix it. And you know, different countries have tried uh, different systems. And this is, this is now, first the Republicans just didn't want any immigrants. They just didn't like immigrants. But now they're kind of backtracking and say, all right, we'll get in the skilled immigrants, which is supposed to be glad news for my group, Indians and Chinese, because you know, we'll come in here. But you know, a nation isn't just made up of computer programmers. Um, uh, and anyone who takes a walk around in New York, you see this wonderful mix of skilled and unskilled, um, which is what makes the city work. Uh, yeah, we'll see also, I think it's interesting, one of um, Ari Zolberg, a political scientist, um, who's unfortunately no longer with us, he, he coined the phrase that immigration makes strange bedfellows, and he's talking about politics, that um, I mean, we'll see how it lines up when they try to introduce a point system, because actually a lot of businesses want to keep low-skilled immigration. <laughs> um, so it's not just, uh, I mean, there's a mix, and, and, uh, and there's a, a demand for low-skilled workers in the United States. So I think we'll, it's, and I think that leads to another point about politics, um, to move away from the causes of migration, um, because there's also um, the issue that you touched on already, but maybe we could talk about it a little bit more, which is the benefits of immigration. Um, and there are, um, many, since you raised it, we could start off with that, with, in, in terms of benefits, economic benefits. Um, um, maybe we could talk more, because there's a host of economic benefits that immigrants, immigrants bring to the United States. Um, in addition, I don't know if you want to talk yeah, about sure. that more. Yeah, sure. This is where the numbers just tell the story. Without immigration, America's economic growth would have been 15% lower from 1990 to 2014. We would be 15 percentage points lower economic growth. So all the gains we've made since the financial crisis would have been wiped out had it not been for immigration. Britain's economic growth in the same time period without immigration would have been a full 20% lower, and Southern Europe up to 30% lower. Um, you know, immigrants are 14% of the American population, but have started a quarter of all new businesses and earned over a third of all American science Nobel Prizes. Um, you know, you look at tech companies, like Fortune 500 companies, it's the immigrant armada that is coming to our shores is actually a rescue fleet. Um, and this is true of uh, all the Western countries, particularly when it comes to pensions, social security. Um, we're just not making enough babies. The replacement rate uh, for fertility is 2.1 babies per woman uh, in her lifetime. Uh, the United States fertility rate has uh, gone down for the fourth year in a row. It's now at 1.7%. Um, next year, the social security system will be actually giving out more money than it takes in. In 15 years, you'll only receive 80 cents on the dollar, so 80% of the benefits that you're entitled to, because the fund will be running out of money. The, the one thing that can save the Social Security Trust Fund is immigration, because immigrants come in, they pay more into the system than they take, uh, take out, they tend to be younger than native-born workers, they work harder and longer. Um, so it's, uh, you know, this is true around the world. The nations which have had higher immigration have experienced higher GDP. Canada now actually hired the consulting firm McKinsey to come up with a strategy about how to increase immigration. It's going to bring in a million new immigrants over the next three years. They need warm bodies for a cold country. Um, 
and, and countries which have gone the other way have really stagnated. Under 2% of Japan is um, foreign-born. And you know what's happening? There's, there's an interesting story I came across. And so in the villages of northern Japan, there's a lot of elderly Japanese people. Um, the young people have flocked to the cities of the south. Um, so as a result, there's a lot of old people and wild boars have st taken to come down from the mountains and rampaging in the villages because there's not enough people left. And so it, it, there's all these reports of these old people getting attacked by 300 pound wild boars. Uh, uh, the Japanese fertility rate is something like you know 1.4 babies uh, per woman. Wild boars make four and a half babies per year. Choose. Immigrants or wild boars? So here we have a contradiction, right? Immigrants are a great boon to the economy, which I think, you know, I think economic studies certainly in the United States show that to be true. They are not hurting native-born workers. Um, they are actually a plus for the economy. Yet, here we have a country politically, right, that is, are, you know, anti-immigrant. And, and, and in fact, Trump, um, who's in this, you know, is obviously this is his issue, right, of, of, of riling up fears about immigration. Um, using, we know he said he's going to be using, this is his big issue in his reelection campaign, is going to be anti-immigrant, um, arousing anti, playing to his base. And so the question is, I mean, that social scientist, I come at this from the social sciences, I mean, this is the big question. Why is this popular? Why is he able to use this? Why with, and particularly among right, white working class men without a college education particularly, why are they, do they find this, why are they, you know, they I, logically they shouldn't be feeling this. In fact, and you would say, well, it's taking their jobs. It's not taking their jobs. If anything, in some ways, it's creating jobs for them. Oh, sorry, it's creating jobs for them. So what's going on? I mean, that's part of your book, and obviously this is a huge subject and a very timely one and a really important one in this country that we want to understand. What is the appeal to a large segment or a significant segment of the population, Trump's base, that they are supporting him because of his constant anti-immigrant, you know, playing to the fears, exacerbating them, and legitimizing anti-immigrant prejudice. So it's not just in this country. Yes, um, it's it, it, all across Europe. So Steve Bannon recently said um, that the origins of this populist wave that we're seeing around the world has its origins in the um, financial crisis um, of uh, 2007, eight. There's not much I agree with Steve Bannon about, but this is one of them. I do agree. And, you know, I, I once drove across the country and I, um, I was just sort of meandering in uh, industrial Pennsylvania. And I came across this little town called Warren, Pennsylvania. And there was a museum of the one industry that had built up the town. It was a, museum uh, of a corporation called the Blair Corporation, which had started out selling raincoats to American GIs during the war. And there were all these pictures of uh, people in the corporation through the years. And you could see, like in the 40s, 50s, 60s, everyone looked really prosperous. There were more and more people in the pictures. This corporation employed most of the people in Warren, Pennsylvania. So there were good union jobs until the photographs started entering the color era, 70s, 80s, 90s, you could see the people in the photos. Um, there were fewer of them, and they literally looked less happy. Um, by this time, uh, America wasn't making garments anymore. Uh, you know, most of the, the raincoats and other garments they were making were foreign made. Uh, the town and the company's fortune started sinking. Things got so bad by the early 2000s that they had to hire an Indian CEO, and the company promptly went bankrupt after that. Um, so then I was walking around this town, and then it was strange. You see young white people stumbling through the streets of this depopulated town like zombies in the middle of the day. I went into an antique store 
where the people of the town were literally selling their family jewels because that's all they had left. And the whole thing reminded me of Harlem in the 1980s. And this man was this, the manager of the antique store, very friendly man, a veteran. He said, the only industry left in this town is the military or, the, or drugs. So it was young white people on opiates. Um, and this town had been devastated. So what had happened to them? This was a town that was almost entirely white. The 20th century had generally been good to them. They weren't trained or educated or equipped for the 21st century. So what happened? And then they see that there are these people in their own country on Wall Street buying apartments that cost $238 million and you know, these yachts and these restaurants and the people on the coast living it up. They're filled with anger. They're filled with a kind of fury because their future too has been stolen. It's not just Indians and Africans and uh, Hondurans. It's, you know, a lot of the working class in this country. There's a giant upward shift of wealth around the, the eight richest people on the planet today, all men, no surprise, own more than half of the planet, or 3.6 billion people combined. So, the, you know, people in, across these countries, the rich countries and the poor countries, are filled with this rage at the rich. And they're going to come for the rich with pitchforks. But the rich, the elites, being no fools, know how that they need to divert this anger away from themselves and onto someone else. Who better than the newest, um, uh, the weakest, the immigrants? Hannah Arendt called it the alliance between the mob and capital. So in the beginning, the Republicans, the country club Republicans, were you know, against Trump. They scoffed at him. They were all these never-Trumpers. But then they realized that Trump could be very convenient for them. He gave them you know, the biggest Christmas gift they'd ever gotten, the tax bill. Another giant upward uh, uh, shift of wealth. And you know, it's going to these same elites that uh, he, was, uh, he and, and Bannon were railing against uh, during the campaign. So we're seeing these populists around the world, like Trump, Erdogan, Modi, Duterte. A populist is nothing but a gifted storyteller. These guys know how to tell a false story well. And the only way they can be fought is by telling a true story better. So that's why I wrote this book. I'm not an economist, I'm not a demographer, I'm not a sociologist, I'm a writer. Um, and I can tell a story. And that's why I, I felt this need to do this book now, because I think that, you know, and, and populists are afraid of storytellers. That's why they're jailing journalists and writers all around the world, uh, because we're the one group that can actually fight them on this story um, and, and, and bring, bring the real story to people, including that town in Warren, Pennsylvania, which is, you know, wants to know uh, why it's suffering. That's certainly a, a note of hope, right? <laughs> More people read your book, we can, right? But I think that there also, I wonder also if there's, um, and this might be particularly to the US case, but elsewhere too, I mean the whole issue of um, to what extent that's racial resentment, um, the belief that whites, you know, are long, no longer going to be, you know, the decline, <laughs> dec we do see the decline of number, proportion of, of the white population, the fact that uh, many, uh, Americans feel that immigrants and uh, non-whites are getting preferential treatment, and they're you know the Arlie I don't know Arlie Hochschild has written a book you know that they're being left behind and they're they're being uh, not favored, and increasingly we have this intense political polarization in this country where um, the Democratic Party appeals to college-educated whites and non-whites. Overwhelmingly, only 10% of Republican supporters are non-whites. So I mean this that's also playing into this. So. I think it's it's complicated, but I agree with you that globalization and the change and the inequality is, is obviously a big factor. Maybe we can come back to a little more positive. Well, you ended a little hope, right, with with at, in your discussion, but also maybe look at um, the role of immigrants and, and immigration in enriching the U.S. We talked about it in terms of the economy, but 
What about, I mean, you're a, a German, well, we'll talk about culture, right? Which isn't, a, a, how have immigrants um, enriched this country and other countries in terms of culturally? Right, so this great fear of, you know, certain whites is the fear of being replaced. Sort of mobs in Charlottesville, they were carrying, they were chanting, we will not be replaced. Um, and it, a lot of it actually, I, as I show in my book, comes from France, this, um, uh, the theory of the grand replacement. There's a poisonous 1973 novel called Camp of the Saints by a man named Jean Raspail, a French book, which imagines a convoy of beggars from my birthplace, Calcutta, coming to invade France and replace them. So this was um, then reprinted by a malevolent Michigan ophthalmologist named John Tanton, um, who's the godfather of the whole American uh, anti-immigrant movements, including I don't know, these FAIR and Numbers USA and the Center for Immigration Studies, all came out of John Tanton, who's also, no surprise, a board member of Planned Parenthood and the Sierra Club, because there's always been a troubling alliance between some environmentalists and pro-abortion uh, activists uh, who you know, want to keep the country sparse and white. Um, so there is this, you know, this number 2044 fills some people with fear. That's the, the year that the country is supposed to become a majority minority nation. And for, you know, even if all of Trump's most extreme measures were to uh, be passed, it would only push that, um, that number back by about around five years. I mean, this is, it's going to happen. This country will be majority non-white, but then the whole notion of what white is is also so questionable. Is Obama half white or half black? I mean, there's so many Hispanics who consider themselves culturally white, um, and that's a good thing. You know, and exhibit A for why immigration works is New York City. Two out of three New Yorkers are immigrants or their children. Um, the city has never been safer or richer. And I grew up in a place which showed me that immigration works. Jackson Heights, uh, at one point, there were more languages spoken in that one zip code, 11372, than any other. So I grew up in a building on 83rd Street in Jackson Heights, filled with Indians and Pakistanis and Haitians and Dominicans, Jews and Muslims. Um, the building was owned by a a uh, Turkish man, but the super was Greek. All these people were killing each other just before they got on the plane <laughs> to come to this building. And, you know, and here we were living next door to our ancient enemies, and, um, and the only thing that united us was uh, Sunday mornings there was a Bollywood uh, TV program on a Spanish uh, TV uh, um, station called Vision of Asia, and the whole building, all the Greeks, Dominicans, Indians, everyone sang along to the Bollywood songs. You know, it's not that we all started loving each other. We still said horribly racist things about each other when we, you know, were back in our apartments or among our own people. And in fact, many of us sent back money to the most extreme political parties or religious groups back in our homelands, you know, we'd, um, while sharing meals with our neighbors uh, who were off the, the other group. So it got me very interested in seeing like, why is it that New York works? I mean, the last time we had any kind of really serious ethnic rioting was in the 1990s maybe. The, in, um, it's the, the Jewish center in Jackson Heights is this you know, uh, quite large building and there aren't many community spaces in, uh, in Jackson Heights. And there were a lot of Jews in Jackson Heights, but they started leaving for the suburbs. So you know what the Jewish center now hosts? The annual iftar celebrations of the Muslim communities in Jackson Heights. The clash of civilizations makes a joyous sound in Jackson Heights. Um, you know, and you can see it works. It, it, New York City has never been more vibrant. And the kind of uh, people who come to New York, they're attracted not just by money, but also by variety. This global creative class we're all trying to attract. They don't want to eat surf and turf. Uh, they want a choice of pupusas and parathas. You know, they want their music to come from all over the world. These are internationally, globally traveled people. 
that's why you know some of the richest most talented people in the world are drawn to new york by this the story of new york that we welcome heterogeneity i think if there is one sort of definition of what's happening around the world it's that homogeneity versus heterogeneity people who think that you know american vali- values are on some farm in iowa uh, and not in jackson heights uh, i think they're in both places um we don't have to choose yeah i think that's happening in other cities in the world too i mean i've spent a lot of time in amsterdam and there also this notion of being an amsterdammer like you know i love new york i love amsterdam but also it's a city with a this a very similar proportion of immigrants and second generation and in which immigrant the children of immigrants very much feel this is their city in a way that i think um uh the children of immigrants in new york feel they're new yorkers mm-hmm. in fact um a book about written by my colleague one of my two of my colleagues inheriting the city talks it was a study of of second generation new yorkers talks about how they feel they don't feel so much american <laughs> because actually american to them often yeah. means white uh but they very much feel that they're new yorkers and i think uh, i think we looked at other cities uh, berlin might be i mean some of the cities that have become very heavily have large not just immigrant but children of immigrant populations because after all they're born in in the country and they're 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 truly you know they're and and i think in new york is an example i a question that i've always asked and i we 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 can this is for another day right <laughs> when you um is you know how typical and how unique is new york are there other cities in the us that are like new york i think los angeles is becoming like new york which is another hopeful note actually houston used in but it, los angeles was actually is interesting because it was seen as a very unfriendly city to immigrants there were a number of uh, pieces that were written in the early 1990s comparing the, uh, in fact i was i was one of the people who was doing this you know why is new york so much more friendly than los angeles well i actually i wrote something about 15 years later saying that's not true anymore <laughs> los angeles is not is just as friendly actually to immigrants as as new york so maybe as the population grows and as the children of immigrants come of age and interact in schools and in colleges and in the workplaces then it becomes a different uh, and and politically there are changes after all yeah. los angeles we have not i mean we have we're behind here right los angeles has had a mexican mayor and garcetti has is part mexican so i mean there are other cities in the, in the country which actually have immigrant or mayors of immer- recent immigrant origin new york has not 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 done that yet but it, i think that's a very important point and i feel that Study places in in london right right <laughs> exactly we've all been reading about <laughs> so places where people have everyday lived experience of immigrants tend to be very pro immigrant and they vote pro immigrant and they vote they, they don't buy the populist message um the people that voted for brexit the biggest own goal in british history tended to be people from the countryside not from london mm-hmm. right uh, it's the same thing in the us the people that vote for trump generally come from places which don't have a lot of migrants um so in country after country this fear of migrants mm-hmm. is doing much more damage to these countries than the migrants ever could brexit um at, at look at what's happening in poland in hungary in austria you know the ghosts of the nazi era are coming back and i've seen this first time i saw this fence on the hungarian serbian border it really looked like something out of world war 2 fences chain link fences watch towers dogs helicopters and a group of you know raggedy refugee women and children this is what you know the enemy horde was what that they were trying to keep out uh, and in, in in all these countries civil liberties have been suspended um the democratic opposition has been ruined uh, the press has been taken over by the government um we're seeing a return to fascism based on what fear of migrants uh of this imagined horde um so it's it's really yeah fear of migrants is much worse for these countries than than the migrants than anything the migrants could do i think one more, just because one i don't know how much long i'm looking at you any i don't know what the schedule is oh let me just i have one can i just have one more i i feel i have to have one we have to one more topic we have to 
deal with, right? Um, and that's um, because this is uh, on, on immigrants and assimilation, okay? Because, um, and I was on a committee, the National Academy of Sciences, um, that investigated this, and you also rely on that and talk about it a lot in your book. And I think it's a lot of com people in the United States say, oh, you know, this common thing about immigrants. Oh, you know, in the, in the old days, immigrants became American. They wanted to learn English. They learned English. They became American right away. Immigrants today, they don't want to be American. They're not becoming American. They're, you know, and there's this notion that they're not assimilating. So maybe you could talk a little bit about Well, that. Nancy <laughs> here is the authority on immigrant assimilation. And this 2015 National Academy of Studies, um, National Academy of Sciences study, it's like over a 500 page document, is the definitive document uh, on uh, American immigrants today. And it demonstrates that immigrants are assimilating in all areas, at least as well as previous generations of immigrants. They're learning English as well or faster. By the third generation, most of these immigrant kids only speak English. Uh, their labor force participation is higher than the native born. Uh, they commit crimes at lower levels. You know, uh, uh, this is all like immigrants, but by the second and third generation, their kids commit crimes or don't commit crimes, get divorced or don't get divorced, uh, just like uh, the native born. In, in other words, they become American. In fact, there's an, <laughs> one, one sociologist says, becoming American is bad for you. Because <laughs> actually, <laughs> actually that's, it is what happens, right? You just said, you know, immigrants don't commit crimes at high rates, their children a little higher, right? And then health is another issue, right? Too many, they eat too much McDonald's, they're not eating too much fatty food, they're not getting enough exercise. They start looking worse in terms of health, actually. So there are many ways, actually, that becoming American is not so good. But the fact is that there should not be worry about assimilation. And no matter what you say, people still worry about it. And of course, we certainly hear our, our president, right, talking about immigrants as criminals when, you know, no matter how many times we say, the, the social scientist mm -hmm. so Suketu says in his book that immigrants have lower crime rates than the native born, people still don't believe it, right? I mean, that that's so, it, but when they read so, your book, they will f have more evidence that this is true. Well, because it's about storytelling, right? It's about anecdote over data. Mm. I mean, an anecdote can be spun any which way. I could trot out a story illustrating anything, mm -hmm. that immigrants are criminals. You bring out someone whose daughter's been killed by an illegal immigrant, and of course you're going to feel sympathy for her. You, go, you, know, you, you bring someone who's, who's been devastated like this, and then the natural human response is to find someone to blame. And then you have a scapegoat, some you know, uh, unpresentable, unshaven Mexican laborer or migrant, and you say, look, they're all like him. That's, and that's where it gets really interesting. And that's, that's where what I see my job as, uh, uh, as telling true stories better. But the stories also, yeah, that can't just be anecdotes. That's why there's all this data that can be used in my book. I'm, uh, the New York Times called it a survey codes in migration, which I was quite happy about. That the, one of the great things about your book is the way that you, are, you use these wonderful stories and your own experiences, but also you, you, have the, you, you survey the literature. So it's a combination of both. Uh, that social scientists don't always do so well. <laughs> they, and, and they, we, we all envy you and admire you <laughs> well, for my, being able to do it so well. I couldn't do what I do if it weren't for you having, doing what you do. Yeah, uh, we have time for just a few questions before we're going to turn to some uh, book sale and signing. Yeah. Yes, um, I was really impressed with the eloquent statement of the Mexican president, Abrador, in response to Trump's hate-filled actions. And um, I thought it was so elegant that I sent it to some friends and people that I thought were friends. And I have a person that I have your email, and I'd really like to go into, you could go into it deeper. But here is a very educated lawyer. 
He's a religious Catholic, goes to Mass every Sunday. And, you know, I won't read his response, but there's one thing that I wanted to, yeah. He said in response, he starts with, sorry, I don't buy the Mexican president's rhetoric. I also don't buy Mexico's lawlessness on so many fronts, including its overwhelming narcotics trades, murders, human trafficking, and this is what I wanted to ask you about. Also, under UN conventions, if people from other countries seek asylum, they must seek it first from the country they first enter. In many cases, Mexico. Why ship them here? Even Tom Friedman says there is a real crisis on the Mexican border, not a manufactured one. So what is the UN that he's, do you know what this is referring to with the, U, the UN convention? Is that true? Is it? So, you know, the whole international um, system of uh, asylum was really something that was instituted in response to Jewish migration during the Holocaust. And these same countries were a shameful record of turning away boatloads of Jews, you know, coming to these countries, looking to save their lives. They were turned away, and in horror, the world decided that we need um, a uniform uh, convention on asylum. And the standards are, you know, a well-founded fear of persecution. It needs to be updated, I think, now to also include people fleeing climate change, which is an equal uh, danger to life. So, you know, there's different interpretations of who can get asylum where, but there's no doubt that a country has to provide asylum to anyone that's requesting that asylum. It, it can't really, you know, go into uh, which countries you've, you've transited through. Um, so, there's, there's been this attack on asylum in Europe and the US, um, but, but the problem is that you can't actually go and sue these countries. I have friends here, like my friend Becca Heller, um, who uh, have fought Trump's Muslim ban, for example, in the courts. So we still have this you know, uh, functioning judiciary that can take on the administration. But you know, with the makeup of the Supreme Court, who knows, that might change too. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, the expression, too much of a good thing, uh, I support immigration. <laughs> How does one determine n quotas that are appropriate and effective in, in the here and now and the long term for America? Right. In a more anecdotal way, when I walk through Midtown um, in the afternoon, I feel like I'm in Delhi. And I love Delhi, but the intensity was, was challenging, so I'm concerned that the numbers be right for America, and I have no idea how that's going to be determined. But that's why I love walking through Midtown, because it reminds me of Delhi. <laughs> I'd, I'd much rather walk through Midtown New York than Midtown, um, it's some suburban uh, town with uh, a shopping mall where you can't even, which doesn't even have a Midtown. We've got a great Midtown here. You know, all our cities should have this kind of density. That's what saves cities. So in my book, I've got the example of a town called Schenectady, which is in upstate New York. Schenectady was filled with um, Poles and Irish um, who worked in the factories there. So uh, GE was founded in Schenectady. It had a big plant, employed everyone. GE pulled out of Schenectady, it was like a bomb hit the city. Uh, it was desolate, it, it you know, looked like Detroit. Um, the mayor of Schenectady, a man named Albert Judzinski, is of Polish origin, he heard about um, the Guyanese community. Um, there was a Guyanese man building a temple in Schenectady and uh, he, the mayor was Republican and he said, where can I get more of you people? We need you know, people here. He said, come down to Richmond Hill. He said, oh yeah, if we can give them government assistance. And the guy next guy says, we don't believe in public assistance. The Republican mayor says, you're singing my tune. So the mayor started going to Richmond Hill in Queens, uh, which looks like Delhi, and 
started bringing in busloads of people from the Guyanese community to Schenectady. There's 10,000 Guyanese in Schenectady right now. There's a Guyanese cricket league, there's a National Guyana Day, there's Guyanese restaurants, there are little shops, real estate companies. It's not like it's a boom town, but they turned around the decline of the town. The same thing with Utica, which is 7,000 Bosnians. The city of Detroit is losing population as a whole and has been losing population at an alarming rate for the longest time. But there's an enclave in the middle of the city of Detroit called Hamtramck which is its own self-governing city, which is one-third Muslim, and it's booming. It's the one uh, city in the country which has a Muslim-majority city council. There's people there. So the question of how many people we can let in, many, many more people than we have right now. The US ranks 191st in the world in terms of density. Our cities are much less dense than European cities. Um, um, 80% of Americans live in 3% of uh, the United States. There's a, elbow room is still abundant on our frontier. Hi, um, I, um, I'm a, my name is Steve Diner and I, uh, I'm a professor at um, Rutgers University in Newark where 78% of our undergraduates are either immigrants or children of immigrants, but that aside, um, in the history of American immigration, this hatred of immigrants, this racism, goes way, way back. You know, the Irish were gonna kill America, my God, they're Catholics, and they can't be trusted, and they're, you know. And while the notion of whiteness does take shape over time, uh, still the whole history of American immigration is, you know, includes a history of virulent opposition to whatever groups were coming, Poles or Italians or Jews or whatever, on the grounds that they were gonna destroy the real Americans who were Anglo whites. Uh, any comments on yeah. that? Yeah, listen, Ben Franklin in the 1700s started railing against this group of newcomers who were coming into the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. These people, they don't speak our language, they don't assimilate, they've got their strange customs, their strange foods. We will never be able to assimilate Germans. He called them the Palatine Boers, uh, the ancestors of our current president. You know? So after the Germans, you know, <laughs> there were the Italians, the Irish, the Know Nothing Party was formed in reaction to Catholics coming in, Protestants didn't like Catholics coming in. There were racial quotas against Southern Europeans. There were esteemed scientists um, and the president of Princeton University, Woodrow Wilson, who held that certain uh, Northern Europeans uh, races were genetically and racially superior to Southern European races. Um, you know, um, and this was, this was widespread. So that, that kind of discrimination now, which was legitimized, given scientific sanction on the basis of IQ or race uh, or the size of your head, that literally people would measure cranial sizes. It's now that old uh, bogeyman has, has a new name, it's called culture. Now the discrimination is about culture. Um, I consulted with, with Nancy when I, Time magazine asked me to review a book written by the tiger mom herself, Amy Chua, and her, her husband. Um, and it was called The Triple Package, and it purported to demonstrate that certain immigrant groups were culturally superior to other immigrant groups. So the superior ones included Indians, Chinese, Jews, and the inferior ones were Mexicans, Irish, you know, that didn't have this, uh, this culture. So it's as much hogwash as all of the other theories about who should be let in and who are not. You know, people are people. Are people. There's just absolutely no um, scientific evidence um, that Nordic countries are superior to what Trump called shithole countries. You know? But we're still having this debate at this late date. 
Uh, let me just add, oh, can I just say one thing? I, 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 we, I mean, I, we could go on forever on this topic, but I think, yes, we've obviously in the United States had nativism and racism against immigrant groups. Um, but at the same time, I think um, it is cause for ho a reason for hope, right? Because those groups did become American, they were accepted. Now, I mean, we can't, the, the question really is, um, or with other conditions that the social and economic and political conditions that let the, uh, that uh, underlie, underlay that, that transformation, are they or are their equivalent going to be ha here today or in the future? And I think many of them will be or their parallels. I mean, we could talk more about that, but I think the, the notion that um, there are these amazing changes that people forget that their ancestors were discriminated against, that there was so much anti-immigrant feeling in the past against Jews, against Italians, against the Irish, against the Germans, and yet now they're thought of as just white people, right? And that they're not thought of in these uh, negative racial terms or their religions or their religions have become part of America, right? Yeah. And, and you know, Protestant, Catholic, and Jew, that is, that's something that <laughs> has not been there forever. So I think that the notion that there's change and that and that 50 years from now we may not recognize what we have to you know that that the immigrant already we've seen change actually in the way or certain groups are viewed in this country and i think just to add one on a group that we haven't talked about too much um, that I think have experienced the greatest in some ways prejudice and discrimination and legal barriers in this country have been the descendants of African slaves. And I think that that makes the United States different from some of the other countries of immigration and also creates special problems for that group. Um, and what's interesting, I think, in the present movement, because after all, if you think back, I mean, it was the, uh, there's still a lot of anti-black prejudice or anti in the United States. Um, but what's happened interestingly is that become, whether that's become taboo to, I mean, it, what's become legitimate is to be anti-immigrant. Mm -hmm. And no, I mean, you can be very, I mean, Trump is very visibly anti-immigrant and says all these things against immigrants, but notice he, he's more still, he doesn't say them about yeah. blacks. And I think that, but I think his supporters are also not just anti-immigrant. <laughs> I think there's also, uh, it's African-American. So I think we should, just to add something extra into the mix. So. No, that, that's an interesting um, point you made about people now, as they get assimilated, they shut the door behind them. Last to an end, shut the door. So maybe, you know, when, and it's already happening with my people. There's certain groups of Indians who are saying, we should only let in skilled immigrants and not so much these other unskilled, and clearly they mean the Latinos, right? So when we start becoming racist ourselves, maybe then we'll be fully American like everyone else. <laughs> um, so I'm actually an immigrant, right? I have immigrated to three continents. And uh, as uh, the way politicians use immigration in this country, like, just now, you guys talk about Donald Trump. I would say just as an immigrant, uh, what's his name, um, uh, Obama, deported more immigrants than George Bush, uh, Clinton, and George Bush's father together, right? Uh, George Bush tried to pass uh, immigration amnesty is stopped by Democrats. So it's really interesting how this moment in life is a, is a uh, Republican doing the bad thing. But politi politicians have used immigration as a weapon. I think you're absolutely right. I mean, Obama had a nickname, Deporter in Chief. And I don't know if it's Still true, but I think he, he might have actually deported more people during his term than Trump has. Uh, so yeah, it's not a Democrat or Republican issue. There are lots of Republicans who are very pro-immigration. Uh, some of the best uh, research done on the contribution of immigrants has been by the libertarian and often very right-wing Cato Institute, and I cite a lot of these studies. Um, so it, yeah, it's not as simple as you know, this party or that party. And you're right, it is politicians um, trying to win votes, not just in this country, but in 
most countries. I mean, just as you know, uh, Americans have uh, American politicians rail against uh, Mexicans, Indians rail against Bangladeshis. There's act an actual fence on the border between uh, India and Bangladesh, and in the most recent Indian election, uh, there were people in Modi's BJP party who were railing against Bengali immigrants. So it's, it's also not restricted to you know, the white nations. So I know that um, your point about populists being good storytellers is well taken. Yeah. And um, we have a, a presidential election coming up. And I'm wondering which of the candidates, or you know, maybe there's several, mm -hmm. who you think might be able to make that compelling case mm -hmm that immigrants, oh, using all of your facts, using all your stories, who are the, our best hopes at a storyteller who might be able to push back against the effective storytelling we're hearing on uh, the other side? So it's coming up now. I mean, they're, they're putting out um, their policy papers on immigration. Julian Castro so far seems to have the most developed one. I don't know if he has you know, the best chances of getting elected. Uh, Elizabeth Warren seems pretty strong. And like all of the uh, Democratic candidates uh, are, are very pro-immigration. And, you know, the, the, I don't think that's a huge difference. It just depends on how they want that, that mixture of family reunification versus skills-based immigration um, and the enforcement. I mean, some of them want to abolish ICE. Others don't. Um, but in the end, you know, the answer and, and the happy ending of my book is politics. Um, so in that dread year 2016, I got a call from my brother-in-law who um, worked for the state treasurer in North Carolina. Uh, and he is Bengali-American. His parents were immigrants from Calcutta. Um, married my sister who moved down there. They have two kids. And he, he called me and said, um, I think I want to run for state senate. I said, in North Carolina? How are you going to support my sister? <laughs> <laughs> he said, no, I think I, I got a shot. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try. He'd never run for political office before. He was running in a district that was 70% white. It was Raleigh, it was, it's a democratic uh, city, but he was running against a man with the fine old southern name of Ellis Hankins, head of the League of North Carolina Municipalities. He just thought the election was his by divine right. And there was Jay, <laughs> this um, you know, very amiable, but uh, you know, he's Indian, and most of the people he was trying to get to vote for him couldn't pronounce his last name, Chowdhury. He had to train his election staff in pronouncing his last name so that they could. So anyway, he called me, and because his family and we love him, uh, I went down to campaign for him. My two sons went down to campaign for him. And we started knocking on doors. My younger son had a gun pulled on him. I had a dog set on me, although it was a small dog, a poodle named Chewy. <laughs> Chewy, Chewy, you get back here, Chewy. Vicious, those poodles. Um, but, you know, we knocked on 10,000 doors. Jay himself knocked on 10,000 doors. The campaign knocked on 14,000 doors. And he took his message, which was about schools. The Republicans have gutted uh, Raleigh schools. This was what was really important to people. All his neighbors, white neighbors, uh, Indian neighbors, black neighbors, went out and campaigned for him because they knew him as a good and decent man. And you know what? In that horrible year, 2016, when Trump got elected, I went down and personally saw my brother-in-law is a progressive Democrat in the Deep South, get elected in a landslide, and he's now the majority whip in the Democratic Senate, in, in the Senate of North Carolina, which is not controlled by Democrats, but is the majority whip. My, the, sorry, the minority whip, yeah. Okay, so we have time for just one last question, and after that, Kato is going to sign his book for you, and you, you all want to get this book, right? So you can continue the conversation. Thank you. Um, 
Hi, I, um, I'm an immigrant as well, and I've now lived in Europe, and this is my American stint across at the Atlantic. I'm also from Bombay, which kind of is probably the most immigrant welcoming city, I'd like to think. But there's always been this um, slightly awkward, controversial, heartbreaking point about um, choosing the immigrants that we want, you know. And there's this whole conversation about we don't want anyone to be an economic burden on the city. And um, there is this whole conversation about, you know, when they come in, you know, are they going to be living on the roads? Are they going to be putting up shanties and what that does to our way of life. Um, so I'm, I, I was just curious to see in, in your views, you know, what space does this population occupy? Because they're really coming to us in hope and opportunity um, and to assimilate. Um, at the same time, it's a very rough road for not just them, but even their surroundings. And that friction, I think, causes a lot of emotional upheaval. So I just wanted to get your views on sure. that. So look, there are short-term adverse effects of immigration. Where if there's a huge influx of people that need a lot of services or that will compete for um, unskilled labor jobs with the native born, there are groups of people such as high school dropouts who in the short term do suffer when there's a big influx of immigrants all at once. But then there are rational policies that we as a nation can take to deal with these adverse effects. So one solution if you know um, immigration is hurting high school dropouts is to keep more people in high school, and to, uh, it, to give the native born the skills that they need, you know, like Germany has done with its vocational training so that uh, they can get jobs that pay a decent wage. Another is an expansion of the earned income tax credit which helps both uh, native-born poor as well as uh, new immigrants. Um, and a third, uh, which you know, I'd like to propose, is a tax on the corporations that benefit by immigration, such as tech, uh, tech companies, uh, whether you call it a fee or a levy or a tax. There should be some redistribution of the the money that they make by br uh, bringing in, you know, skilled immigrants um, to the communities that are affected, like the communities along the border whose schools and hospitals are undeniably getting swamped, right? There are intelligent ways that we as a nation can deal with immigration. Unfortunately, the way we're dealing with it is anything but intelligent. Um, we have no coherent immigration policy as a nation. The, the House and the Senate are uh, at loggerheads. Uh, you know, there's no hope of passing any kind of immigration legislation in this Congress or the next, because we're just so divided. And as a result, the people are going to keep coming if a wall is not going to stop them. Most people who uh, are here in the country illegally don't come over the wall. They overstay their visas. Um, and we still won't have a policy. And that's it will hurt these communities uh, along the border and some of our cities um, because we're just not doing it rationally as a nation. Okay, actually one more. Thank you. Um, I guess first I want to you know, just thank you for tackling kind of the big issues. It's great that you, you know, sat down and were inspired to write this. So appreciate that. Um, and like obviously, I loved a lot of the the facts you sort of provided. Um, but like, I guess my thing is, and we keep kind of going back to the same thing. We worry that kind of the storytelling on the anti-immigrant side is just simpler. Um, you know, this country's wealth and comfort has been built on global domination and exploitation. Um, and the arguments that we're going to be wealthier, the arguments that we're going to you know have better food are just hard for people to buy. Kind of post the financial crisis in the last forty years, where. You know, we've, I think we found out that not everybody can win in the way the economy is sort of set up. So just given that the numbers are going to be so much larger kind of coming up and the sort of 2044, 2044 that you mentioned, like the axis of domination that's been part of the world for the last 500 years is going to be tilted in some way. I just, from a messaging perspective and a storytelling perspective, I sort of equate a little bit of the, we're all gonna be wealthier, we're all gonna have better food to kind of more of a 
Hillary Clinton 2016 sort of story. And I'm wondering if we should pivot more to something that talks about like our need to sacrifice, our responsibility, our need to give up sort of privilege because you know, we're responsible for sort of what's happening and there's something that kind of needs to be given up to make a more egalitarian world that we're gonna need. So my answer to your question is appearing at 6 a.m. tomorrow morning in the pages of the New York Times. I've written an op-ed called Immigration as Reparations, which is exactly this, that we, you know, it's not just, the debate shouldn't just be about what is good for America or England as a country. It should be, what are we morally obligated to pay to the world for what we've done, you know? It's um, what we've done to the climate, what we've done through colonialism, what we've done through wars, what we've done through inequality. Um, and I argue that if we've, uh, went into this illegal and unnecessary war in Iraq, which cost 600,000 Iraqi lives, well, we should let in 600,000 Iraqis. For each death that we've caused, one person gets a chance for a new life. If we've put one quarter of the excess carbon in the atmosphere, and there's going to be a, you know, however many million people displaced through climate change, then one quarter of these refugees, we are morally obligated to take in. So absolutely, I agree with you that it's, it's not just, um, you know, I, I want to sort of turn the tables on the global debate around uh, immigration to not look at it just from the viewpoint of the, uh, the countries people are immigrating to, but, you know, the viewpoints of the migrants themselves. In the end, I'm not so much calling for open borders, I'm calling for open hearts. I'm asking my readers, what would you do? If you have a child that's you know, uh, going to be murdered by the gangs or is going to starve to death in front of your eyes, you too would pick up your child and do whatever you can to give the child a better life. In my book, you know, Trump calls immigrants rapists and r murderers and robbers. I call them ordinary heroes because almost without exception, the migrants that I've met around the world and whose stories I tell in this book, they're ordinary heroes. They're moving, not so much for themselves, but for their children. And they all want what any of us want here in the rich countries, a better life for our kids. Thank you so much. <laughs>